and, uh, and, and one of the things that I've, I've learned about Yolanda at that, in the process of that, was that uh, unlike a lot of us who are engaging with this kind of work from, let's say, in a more of a grassroots way, like from the low, uh, Yolanda had a very different way of, of approaching change, and that was from a, a higher level of administration. So it was fascinating to see how these were complementary, and, and it was fascinating to see how rare this is. Because almost everybody on these panels, and I've done a lot of them, who are joining us, were people working as, as faculty, usually as contracted faculty, um, um, sessionals, TAs, um, people who are on the margins of, of, of scholarship and activism, uh, a few um, senior faculty, but we hardly had people that had the power to push things from above. And I think many people learn early in their careers that they should um, leave all of these activism business and, and changing business for later when they get in a higher position because it puts them in risk. So they need to kind of only do what is really important and not get into various conflicts with the university and once they're stable and in a good space, they can uh, push for change. And usually we don't see a lot of people get to that point and still are eager to change things. And one of the amazing thing about Yolanda is that she is in that place. Um, and the other thing is that I have never seen someone mentor students the way that she does. Um, whenever I see her, there's always a student or two that she's taking care of. And <laughs> in some magical way, I was also someone that she decided to take care of. And uh, she was also an important part of my decision to come back to Israel. Um, so I really thank you for that. And I thank you for making the trip here um, and helping us think about a change from above and on insisting that universities are a place that, an institution, a place that need to push for a change. Not only that we need to struggle to change it, but need to kind of model a social change, which is something that we don't get to advocate for as much as we want like to. So thanks so much. Well, hello everybody. I think now I have to live up to the hype, <laughs> right? <laughs> that um, I've been given here today. And um, I am very pleased to be here. Thank you for the invitation and thank you for your enlightened dean who also had the foresight to uh, support this kind of work because it's in spaces like this that the transformation begins for the institution. Because sometimes the institution doesn't know the need to transform. <laughs> and they are not in positions to do that. I should tell you <coughs> that I am the product of two working class folks in the US, um, African Americans who clearly um, wanted a better education, good education for their um, children. I'm a product of public higher education in the United States. Uh, in California, we have a three-tiered system of higher education, which allows you, regardless of who you are, if you work hard enough, you can enter tertiary education and can matriculate through the two-year system, four-year system, and the PhD system. So I'm a product of that system. And I like to tell people that because I often talk to young uh, kids like myself who have no sense that this is something that they can achieve. And this is a privileged space uh, that I'm in today. And sometimes, even me, as old as I am, going into spaces feel as though, how did I get to this place? <laughs> and what am I going to do while I'm here? So what I want to do today is to talk about some of the work that I've done. I've been a, a faculty member and administrator um, for as long as I can remember. Not sometimes both the same, sometimes separately. I'm now in a faculty role. 
so I can focus on the writing and getting things done I could get done when I was a researcher. I've been a faculty member at the department chair, a dean, a provost, a university president, the president of a national higher education association that had over 500 universities and colleges in the system. And so I've seen education and change from a lot of positions. I'm a cultural anthropologist by training, and I turned that institutional lens for the past, I'd say, seven to 10 years on the university itself. So I've uh, gone from looking at small um, uh, islands in the Caribbean <laughs> to looking at large and small institutions of higher ed to ask that question, why so slow? The kinds of changes that need to happen and take place if we are to be inclusive institutions the way we say we want to be, because that's what we all say. And I presume um, Hebrew University does that. So what I want to do is to, and I'm, my standpoint is that person who's done all these things, and I bring that into the room. I'm writing a book now for leaders in higher education in the United States to help them figure out how to move the needle, if they really want to, because that's what they say. We don't know how to do this. So part of why I said yes, I would come, is because I want you all, from your perspective, to talk also about the things that would help you do your work, how you know, how administrators could help facilitate that. So I'm going to do this in several ways. I'm going to talk about the dilemmas that are in higher education in the U.S. We have plenty because the higher edu the dilemmas in higher ed are about the dilemmas in the larger society, mm -hmm. and we're the microcosm where a lot of those issues play out every day. And I would say that we're not equipped to handle those. Uh, <clears throat> We'll, I'll say a little bit about institutional identities. There is no one solution. There are lots of solutions for the institutional type, and so I want to talk a bit about that. I want to talk about the kind of theorizing that I'm doing around this work of what I'm calling critical cultural competence, because it's, it's what people need in institutions to change institutions. And it's not about a formula, it's not about uh, a one size fits all. It's about a way of thinking, it's a way of knowing, it's a way of being, that once you take on that role of being a leader, the expectation is you know how to handle situations. So I'm gonna show you some examples of situations that have been handled well, and some that have not, <laughs> some that are still going. So we're looking at toward institutional wide models for critical cultural competency, some promising practices, and the kind of work that we're doing to try and move things, um, move that needle, and then the way forward. So the luxury for me being here is to <coughs> focus on, um, before we implement policies and practices, what's the data, what's the research behind the things that we're doing. Because I think a lot of times in, in our institutions, we're not, um, <clears throat> we're not basing what we do on what we know, we're basing what we do on tradition and the way things have been done. And not really sure how to move uh, the, the institution forward. So which way do I press it to go forward? Counterintuitive. <laughs> oh. For us, the same one. Oh. not for anybody else. Oh, the up one? The one that <coughs> goes backwards? Maybe? Yeah. Okay, that one? No. <laughs> it's not on. It's on? Or is it not on? Oh, this is a different one than I oh, have. Oh, okay. That's Sorry about that. Can I have it? Yeah. Different from the one that was today. Just be like uh, a so bit inserted. All right. Okay. Like you would expect. A bit inserted. <laughs> so, my anthropological research 
focuses on the origins of social inequality. So by definition, I have been oriented to looking at structures and, um, and, and the institutionalization of structures in terms of, of, of change. And the dilemmas uh, that we're looking at now on college campuses around, be careful what you wish for, because for the last 30 years we've been basically saying in the US that we want inclusive democracy within <coughs> our institutions. So as our campuses are becoming more and more diverse, we're seeing more and more resistance to the kind of systemic change that needs to happen to make that work. And so then what we're seeing is unrest on our campuses uh, <clears throat> due to the limits of the clashes of free speech. So there's a big free speech um, a, a narrative that's going on among the leadership, the presidents, and the vice presidents, provosts of our universities, that we have to be nice and we have to be civil to each other. And we know that from the 1960s that while, yes, we can uh, have peaceful demonstrations and what have you, sometimes that does not work. So speaking truth to power sometimes is not nice. And our students have the power to, to do that. We're also looking at campuses that are re-examining their histories. So it's like, be careful what you, again, wish for. When your students <coughs> read the histories of, your, of the institutions, what they see are the gross inequalities that have happened to women, to minorities, to <coughs> LGBT folks, to, it's, it's like, how do you reconcile those things? And a lot of administrators don't know how to do that. And when you have your offices occupied by students, how do you respond? And we have institutions that, where it's ended up pretty awful. And students of color, women students, basically say, we don't want to be here. These are not the places that we want. So as a result, we have heightened student protests. And if that was not enough, I mean, that's just internally, right? This is just the, the kind of growth dynamics and churning of institutions that are in the process of change. Being pushed from the bottom, because a lot of these changes are student-oriented and more increasingly by faculty of color on our campuses. Okay, because most of, student, most of the faculty in, in the US are predominantly white faculties and male. So as those demographics shift, that's when we're starting to see these things. So <coughs> external challenges are also happening for powerful political figures. The rise of neoconservatism in the United States is not just outside of our outside of the gates of the university. It comes into our classrooms. They do not like any critical anything, <laughs> theory, whatever. Uh, they do not like uh, white male hegemony challenged in any way. They do not like messing with the curriculum, the curriculum that they knew. And for the ones who, are, who haven't gone to college, this latching onto this notion there was a better time in our country when America was great. And America is not great anymore because of the unwashed masses who are in the institution and for women who have stepped out of their place. So as a result of that, we have intentional challenges coming to our campuses. We have people who are marking campuses like the University of California to come and to incite students to attack them verbally or whatever so that there's a kind of conversation that goes on. <clears throat> and they're, they're funded, many of the organizations, by big money. Conservative think tanks are funding universities all across the United States of student groups whose job it is is to challenge what we're teaching in our classrooms. And to take 
what we're doing in our classrooms. Sounds familiar? <laughs> so you have that, sure. So we have some things in common, right? <laughs> and then, <clears throat> On the on the on the right from the conservatives, and you probably have this too, the questioning of the value of higher education itself. That is, should higher education be for everybody? Now, if you ever thought you'd hear something like that in the United <laughs> States, this country that's supposed to be open for all, right? It's like, should everybody have a college degree? Actually, should everybody have citizenship in our country. That's, that's another one. And so I would say our country is in a very dis, uh, device mode domestically with the rise of this nationalist populism, which is not about uh, limiting government as much as it is about going back to the way things were. <coughs> And the international percussion, uh, repercussions from all of our actions have plummeted our international student populations. So who wants to come to a country where, <coughs> where the leader of the country uh, <coughs> is saying that student, certain students come from a-hole countries, right? So there's a, I, and I guess the point is, we do not live in a cocoon, we do not live in a bubble, that there's a relationship between what our, our campus and society. And to acknowledge that, I think, is to, is to be very helpful for the work that we want to do. Mm -hmm. cool. All right. Cool. So, <coughs> so, so, so we get a handle on this. <coughs> We ask the question, who are institutions set up for? And if we go back to some of our earliest institutions, which are Harvard and Princeton, they definitely were not set up for the people who are there today, right? Uh, and as a result of that, we have separate kinds of institutions and institutional types in the United States. We have over 5,000 institutions. We have private institutions, we have public institutions, we have land grant institutions, we have women's colleges, when women were not allowed to go to, um, to male, male colleges, and we have colleges for African Americans, colleges and universities for African Americans, because they were not allowed to go to universities with white students, uh, historically black colleges and universities, and there's a little side story that I'm gonna tell right now, and that is, <coughs> Uh, and during World War II, uh, or I would say just before World War II, when uh, many Jews were fleeing Europe and they would come to the United States, particularly the professorate, they could not get jobs in the white institutions in the United States. And they were hired into a lot of the historically black colleges and universities in our country. So there's a legacy in the United States with a reverence for these faculty who came in and established <laughs> departments that are world renowned today at Howard University, at uh, there are over 100 different ones. But that, those are the institutions <coughs> that took faculty in. So uh, I've also been doing some work at the University of Sydney where I had a Fulbright and and the question you're, I'm hearing from you that and that you're going through some of the same things here and the universities that you all represent in the room here. So we can talk about that later. And the question I have, and one of the reasons for writing this book, is are we equipped to have those conversations on our campuses, even if leadership is willing to do the change? Are they capable, do they have the capacity to do that? And the answer is no. So it, but I also say, if we don't have those conversations and take the kind of actions that we need, then we, us in this room, become certifiers then of the status quo. Because we have, I believe, with the kind of research that you're doing and the work that you're doing, <coughs> the information that is needed for 
that change to take place, if there is institutional will to do that. There we go. So as, as I'm doing this theorization of critical cultural competence, looking, and I'm pulling together literature from higher ed, from critical race theory, and from um, intersectional theory, <clears throat> I'm going out of my field of anthropology and looking at political science and this uh, translational science of democracy. So this is not just about what we're doing in our classrooms and what we're doing in our institutions. This is about the future for us in the U.S. of what our democracy is going to be and who is going to be able to call themselves Americans. And back to you know, the history for, for, for sure. And the idea of resistance, scholars as resistance, and then uh, <clears throat> this decolonizing studies in education. Sort of mapping the long view. This is not a overnight proposition. This is for the long haul that we're doing this work. In the area of critical race theory, you know, you probably know a lot of these, these names. Some of them are from anthropology, some of them from education. But bringing together <coughs> that critical race with, um, uh, <coughs> with um, the other theory theories uh, are really a higher ed theory is really important. <coughs> Intersectionality, of course, the Kimberly Crenshaw, and, and, and unifying race, class, and gender, right? Bracken's work. And some of you also may know her other ones when Jews became white folks. That's an article that I use in my theory class. Her Patricia Hill Collins, Anatomies of Relatedness, Considering Personhood in uh, Aboriginal Australia. So the work that I'm doing in Australia is with graduate students uh, from traditional um, um, indigenous lands. And the problem with some of them is that the institutions do not allow them to walk into worlds. They have to give up one for the other. And that is not, that is not something that they can do. And uh, looking at standpoint, I talked a little bit about this yesterday, is that sort of claiming and owning who we are and what we bring to the table, because that's what's going to change the paradigm. So what does it mean for us to look at critical cultural competence at a whole institutional level? And this is the thing that I'm pushing because it's not about what we can do individually, but it's about the institution and whose job it is in the institution to do this work. So it's the whole institutional level. What are aspirational models to look at? Is anybody even doing this work? And I'm going to suggest some guideposts for us to look at along the way. And you will probably know where your institution fits along a continuum like this. So looking at all the research and coming up with an organizational model is that it's the leadership. It is the leadership of the institution. And that, me, that includes you, but not only you. It starts at the top of the institution with the board, the chancellor or vice chancellor, or whatever you, the, the title is. They have to be able to walk the walk and talk the talk. And most of them can't, because that's not how they've been trained. It's also the senior administrators. And here, this job right here, chief diversity officer, that's been a position that has come into our institutions over the past 10 years. And sometimes they're on the academic side, sometimes they're on the student affairs side, sometimes they're in, the, in administration. But the job for this transformation has been situated in this, this person here. And the research shows that um, the only thing it does is it burns the person out. <laughs> because they don't have the power, they don't have the ability to affect change from the top. So I, for eight years in my institution, said, okay, I'm gonna play, I'm gonna play that role. 
because I know exactly what needs to happen, and I can tell you some stories about that. But Chief Diversity Officer is not the panacea. It still begs what happens above. We have enlightened deans, as you have here. We have department heads. We have faculty, including adjunct, and more and more of our faculty are adjunct or contract faculty, and they tend to be shut out of departments and departmental decisions. And they're the folks who are on the front lines with our students. They're the people who work with our students every day. Often overlooked also are staff at various levels. And the best practice around this is to create surveys, we call them climate surveys in the US, that surface what their issues are and how to engage them in the process. Because often staff are always, are the people that are on the front lines as well. They're the ones that are, who see our students in admissions and make admissions decisions and are involved with all kinds of things. So <clears throat> students as well, I often, tells students that they are the they are the catalyst for a lot of this change and that they also have to learn how to be strategic. Oh, I forgot to tell you guys. When I was in the grad school, I, I was a, a activist. I was a community organizer. So I knew how to bring different groups of people together. And I brought that skill set, I brought that skill set with me into every job that I've had in the university. It has been very helpful because it lets you look at this hierarchy, the structure, and figure out, figure out how to blow it up and turn it on its side, or do whatever you need to do to, to get the job done. So <clears throat> organizing students around climate issues for us, giving them the leadership training is also very, very important. So those are the best practices to date. Uh, the University of California, I want to just say a few things about it because we're the largest public research university in the United States. We have 10 campuses. And we had a law passed in 2000 that said we could not take gender, race, or ethnicity into account in any of our hiring practices and in any of our decisions we made around mm. curriculum and stuff like that. That it had to be neutral, race neutral, right? It had to be gender neutral. And we all know structurally that there is no such thing as that. But that's the, that was a policy, that was the way it was being done. So <clears throat> we as faculty decided that, okay, that may be the law, but nobody tells us what we do in our classrooms or how to define excellence. So for three years, we worked on a statement that eventually the regents adopted who knew nothing about diversity. <laughs> These are mega, mega billionaires in, in California who got their appointments because they gave money to campaigns. That's how that works in the states. And, but they knew that they didn't know anything. <laughs> and so they said, oh, it sounds reasonable to us because we live in California. The demographics in California are such, 10 years ago, we became a majority minority state. You know what that means? That there is no dominant population. Now, if, I, if, I, if you ask me who has a power in the state, that would be a different kind of situation. Okay. So part of what we did, and I'm not going to go through all of it, is to show you how we took that term diversity, which is problematic, I understand that, but that was the language of the time, and tied it to excellence, to our academic mission, to helping to fulfill the university, big University of California mission of helping to create people who can work and be leaders in our complex society. 
So we tie it to those things. So a pluralistic diversity then can model a process of proposing and testing ideas through respectful civil communication. And so it goes on and on and on. But the bottom line is that we did everything we wanted to do without calling it, uh, calling out gender or calling out race, which we couldn't do. But every single day we're being challenged for having this statement because the on the on the right they're saying we're violating the law, the law of California, and we're saying take us to court. That's kind of our that's kind of our ours. So that's what we're doing right now, and the efficacy of these efforts need to be tracked, and which is why data is so important, and research is so important around these issues. And there is a there are growing um, bodies of research on um, the impact of diversity in various places, the impact of the presence of difference in problem solving, all kinds of things. You all know that literature. Um, but for our administration on our campuses, it's important for them to be able, as leaders, to talk about the value added of doing this kind of work. Mm -hmm. And that's where I think research and some of the research that you're doing can be helpful. If we're focused on who our students are, how they learn, and their success, then we have no choice but to do that. So we have to come up with some ways of measuring critical cultural competence um, in institutional structures and policies and practicing practices. It's not just about training. Did you all um, see the incident where a, um, I think it was about three or four months ago, a Starbucks uh, worker called the police because two African American mm -hmm. men were in the... Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. Philadelphia one? Yes, in Philadelphia. Yes. Okay. They closed the, all the stores and they had a training session for all the baristas and the people who worked there. And we all know as educators that a training session, one training session is not going to change things. So the idea is if we were to create a curriculum or a set of training programs for our institutions that actually did achieve what we wanted to do, what would they look like? It's not about training, it's about education. It's about changing the way people think about themselves and their positions within the institution. So assessment is very, very important here. So I want to talk about three promising, uh, well, actually four, four examples that I'm familiar with. And I'm inter I've interviewed the presidents of all these, these, these institutions. And the, the fifth one I want to do is the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, where the statue of the Confederate statues are being pulled down. And she got into a lot of trouble because on one side she, suggest, she suggested to the uh, <clears throat> people who pulled it down that don't put it back up, but we'll build a building where it can be housed. So the students got really upset. <laughs> And the state legislature said, no, you got to put it back. And she resigned. The president? Yes. She resigned. But before she resigned, she had them remove the statue completely from the campus and whatever they do. But anyway, I want to know that story. So the first one is Brown University, Ruth Simmons. Uh, and uh, the University of California, my boss. Third is Virginia, Teresa Sullivan, and then at the University of Sydney in Australia, the National Center for Cultural Competence. So, Brown University, the Slavery and Justice Project. Brown University, again, students learning the history, right? <laughs> Brown University, it's a private university in Rhode Island, and it had has a history of getting its money 
from the insurance companies that supported that the planters bought insurance for slaves. So when the students found out about that, they went apoplectic. This is several years ago, right? Two years ago, two or three years ago. And she decided, rather than saying, no, I, I'm the president, we don't talk about this, this is what we're going to do. She said, okay, let's think about this, let's talk about this, let's figure out how we can make this an, a teachable moment, an educational moment for not only you, but for the larger Brown community, for the alumni, for the people around. So that's the town-gown relationship. Anyway, she put together a committee uh, of students, faculty, staff, community people, uh, and they came up with a report that basically said, uh, rather than change the names on the buildings, some of the buildings that had the names of the, of the founders, we want to memorialize what happened publicly. <coughs> and so uh, they had an architect and, and they had a history written and this is a <coughs> uh, sort of a remnant of a ball and chain that's in the quad of Brown University. So you can't walk on that campus without seeing this. And there's a, a Stella there that says what that is and why that's there and why that's important and who the people were that were involved. And from there, here's what we're going to do. So as a result of that, they've established name chairs, they've established scholarships, they've established all kinds of ways to take that and do something else with it. So that's one example. Second example, University of California, my boss, Janet Napolitano, was the former Secretary of Homeland Security in the United States, and in 2012, she created the DACA program. And DACA is the program in the United States that is called Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals. These are young kids who are brought to the country by their parents from um, all over the world illegally, but they came as children. We don't ask questions in California. So a student can enroll elementary school, high school, go to college, can't always get scholarships, but they can go to college. And we don't ask questions because that's not what we cared about. So in 2018, the DACA program was supposed to expire March 2018. In March 2018, she sued the President of the United States on behalf of the students of the University of California, not just the DACA students, but on behalf of all the students of the University of California for depriving those students of the ability to be, <coughs> excuse me, get higher education, and the rest of the students from their presence. <laughs> now, I think that was pretty gutsy. <laughs> mm -hmm. But what she did, she discussed what she was going to do with the Board of Regents, with faculty, the Academic Senate, which I'm a member of. There's Academic Senate on each campus, and then there's the Academic Senate all 10 campuses. So she consulted both bodies, and the staff, we have staff council, and the students. <coughs> so we were all, everybody was behind this. And as a result of this, the program is still in place until the courts <clears throat> make a determination as to what they're going to do. Now, for me, that's an example of enlightened leadership. 
and we don't know exactly what's going to happen, but she made a stand on behalf of education, on behalf of diversity, on behalf of uh, students who couldn't have a voice themselves in this process. They were in the shadows. There are students who could not do that. Oops. Give you guys a preview. How you told me to be decisive. <laughs> well, there's a picture, or there was a picture there. <laughs> All right, I'll tell you what the picture was, and you probably have seen it. Young white men with tiki torches, white shirts, khaki pants, marching through the streets of Charlottesville, Virginia, to the campus of uh, Thomas Jefferson's University, saying things like, you will not replace us anti-everything, right? Blacks, Jews, gays, everybody. And the chief diversity officer who I interviewed, when we sang this to Jefferson's University, whom are we talking about? He didn't create it for any woman, for any LGBT person, or any person who is economically disadvantaged, any person who was of color. So he's the dean there, and he's saying part of what's happening in the South, and this is when I talk about regional differences, the southern part of the United States, after the Civil War, there are people who still haven't realized they've lost. <laughs> I guess that's a good way of saying it, right? And so a lot of the cultural traditions, a lot of things that were in place, a lot of the assumptions that were made about privilege are still in place for white males. And Virginia has been very, very rigorous about reaching out to bringing in diverse faculty. And when you have diverse faculty, women, people of color in classrooms who are, who are speaking their truths through their curriculum, they're gonna, they get challenged by the students in the classroom. And they need to know that the administration has their back. Or they're not going to take that risk, particularly if they're untenured. And we know from the research that these folks get uh, reviewed and evaluated differently in terms of their work. And so that's a that's reality. Oh, I wish you could see that picture. I love that picture. But, sorry. So your point here is that he didn't do anything about this? Oh, well, it was the president that I talked to, Teresa Sullivan. Yes, she did. Uh, but he was the person that was... He was the person I was supposed to do something about it, and he basically said, I can only do so much because I'm down in the, I'm down in, remember I told you that position where yeah. they're like middle managers? Yeah. And, you know, he can't change the system. Mm -hmm. And so eventually they had to go to the state legislature, and I don't need to tell you what's going on in this with the governor of Virginia. Mm -hmm. Um, and his black face. <laughs> uh, yeah, the southern part of the United States, any of you who have, who have lived there know what I mean. Um, anyway, it's a work in progress because Charlottesville is a very quaint kind of college town that has tradition and prides itself on being liberal. But when something like this happened, everybody was sort of standing like deer in the headlights. They didn't know what to do because this can't be happening here. Well, it is happening here. And it isn't people with KKK hoods on. These are pre preppy looking kids who are doing this, this stuff. So she's working on this issue and needs help, she's there from uh, people who uh, can give her some guidance. Uh, <clears throat> the University of Sydney is the oldest university in Australia. Any of you know, been there, know Sydney? Yes, 
Yay. When were you there? Oh, okay. Uh, I was there uh, 2017, 2018, just last year, as a Fulbright uh, Distinguished Chair, and I was working with the uh, Vice Chancellor here and the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Indigenous Affairs. And what they did was to establish a all university commitment to addressing uh, the needs of uh, Aboriginal students on that campus. And one of the things they did was to create a structure that would allow that to happen, not just talking about it, but to create a structure with a deputy vice chancellor and assistance and programs. And they got money from the government. This is the head of the government uh, who was there and the head of the university. They have, he, there they have like, uh, what do you call it, ceremonial heads, right, of the institution. So, so they put together a contract and this is kind of unique. It's called the Mingaramura Bunga Barabuga. I mean, it's a mouthful. <laughs> And this is in local language, it means an agreement. And this is the Wiraji people that live, who were there in Sydney before Sydney was Sydney, right? So them and the people from Torres Strait Islands were a part of this agreement. And the goal is to focus on using indigenous knowledge, using indigenous learning and understanding to help drive their diversity initiatives on campus. Now, what I want to do is also tell you, uh, give you an example of something that didn't work. The University of Missouri, about two years ago, uh, three years ago, a group of students came to the president and said, you invited us here and we are seeing an increasing number of nooses on our doors and behavior that is telling us you don't want us here. And the president said, I don't have time to talk about this, so you guys, you know, leave me alone or, you know, sort it out, work, work it out. So he didn't take it, he didn't take it lightly. So this group of students went to the University of Missouri football team. And the University of Missouri football team is made up of predominantly African-American guys, right? And it was the white coach and the African-American players and the white players who decided they were not going to play football in the next game unless the president sat down and talked to those folks. And that happened eventually, because each each time they missed a game, it was a million dollars. So was it because of a commitment to diversity they sat down and talked to them? And then he did, he sat down and talked to them, and he said, I don't understand what you all are complaining about. You're here at the University of Missouri. Shouldn't you be happy? Well, he's not there anymore, <laughs> needless to say. But my question is, how can you become a, a leader of a major university in the United States and have that kind of attitude? <laughs> Who hired you? And what were their expectations? And didn't they understand what the repercussions of this was going to be? Their enrollment is down, students don't want to go there. <coughs> so they're going to have to do a whole lot of, of turning around to, to get back to where they, where they are. So, get to the end here. So, what is the way forward? And I would say that one of the things that we need to do is to know ourselves. And we, you know, we talked about borders and barriers and borders. What are our own borders and barriers that we have to overcome if we are, in fact, going to do this work? And we need to know our institutions in a deep way because a private liberal arts university versus a huge research university, public research university is different in terms of how you would engage 
And the research that you all are doing is key, I believe, for this kind of understanding. We need to understand the barriers to institutional change, both observed and hidden. And it's often the hidden ones that make you think you're crazy. Right? It's sort of like, why, why do people say I'm being sensitive when I say I'm in a room with all these men and they're and I say something and I get ignored and everybody, all the men in the room are talking to each other, right? And if I say something, it's like, oh, well, you just have to speak up. No, well, it's not about that. It's not about that. And it's about naming what the, um, naming what the problem is and having the institution do something about it, not the individual. Mm -hmm. So it isn't the student's problem, it isn't the individual faculty's problem, it's the institution's problem. And then how do you get institutions to, to see that and to do that? Microaggressions, the, uninten the uh, unintentional bias. Yes, there may be unintentional bias, but I've been around long enough to know that a lot of the bias is intentional. <laughs> and you need to name it and figure out what to do about it, which is one of the reasons I like being an administrator. Mm -hmm. because I could say, well, what part of the no don't you understand? <laughs> and so it gave me some pleasure sometimes. <laughs> uh, breaking down the walls and the silos of institutions is something that this work has to do. So that's the barrier, the barriers between academics and student affairs and other kinds of places on the campuses. Students don't see their experiences the way we break down the institution. They see a holistic kind of experience and they expect <coughs> us to figure out how to, how to deal with it in that way. And if we can't break down the walls that separate them, I would say let's think about it in terms of at least having semi-permeable membranes, right? If, they, if they're still rigid. And form alliances, which you're doing, with folks who will speak on your behalf when you are not in the room. That's what this kind of training and edu not, this kind of education is about. Mm -hmm. It's about going, going past, uh, you know, saying and doing the right thing <coughs> because it's the right thing to do, uh, because it is what you're supposed to do, but doing it because it's your job or it's, it's part of the mission of the institution. And one of the things that uh, happened at the University of Sydney, for example, <coughs> is that structurally, because there's only one percent of the population in Australia is indigenous, structurally, they have to be intentional about creating <coughs> structures so that students who did get to the university could be successful. So every college, and I think there are 13 or 14 different faculties in the university had an associate dean for indigenous affairs. Every last one of them. And that, that purpose of that was to figure out ways that the college could work with fulfilling the institution's mission. So there was a program between indigenous study and, pro and the professional schools, business, uh, urban planning, that actually designed internships and courses and workshops that would bring in indigenous students, indigenous community, indigenous knowledge into the institution. Also, you must be a voice to speak for those people not in the room. I said that, be opportunistic, know what is coming, what's on the horizon, funding and grant opportunities, keep abreast of changes and strategic plan. The National Science Foundation in the United States has a goal of, of uh, creating more scientists in the United States. Well, because the demographics are changing, a lot of those scientists are going to be women and underrepresented minorities. So anytime you can tie what you want to do in an institution with what larger structural goals are, that's going to be to your advantage. And so our university got money for 
uh, undergraduates, for graduates, for postdocs, <laughs> uh, uh, who are underrepresented minorities and women to become uh, scientists. The other way is to form coalitions and partnerships. Um, there is a very strong Black Lives Matter movement uh, in Australia that coordinates with the Black Lives Matter movement in the United States. And there's also a very strong gun movement in, the, in Australia that coordinates with the national gun movement here in the US. And a lot of the, the activities and the people involved are staffed by students in the universities who are getting credit through either service learning or other ways of being engaged so that it supports their, their um, work. Uh, women's marches in the US and Canada and elsewhere, they're about, they're anti-Trump, but they're also pro all kinds of things that affect women's lives. So you have all kinds of rights movements that are involved there. Historically in the United States, women of color have been left out of these movements, and they've been mostly white women. Uh, what we're seeing are the coalitions now that are formed around um, other issues of racism, inequality, homophobia, um, and, and the inclusion of um, indigenous women as well, because they were as invisible in the United States and Canada as the Aboriginal folks were in, uh, in Australia. <coughs> this is a, another event that was sponsored by the university, uh, where students were from the University of Sydney was involved, and this was the Australia, they have an Australia Day in, in Australia, but Aboriginal groups and have, I call it the, uh, <coughs> excuse me, um, Invasion Day. And what's interesting is that this movement is now uh, in the United States where First Nations people are saying that, are pushing back against Columbus, that whole Columbus myth, as well as Thanksgiving. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's research, it's based on research, it's not, just about the national narrative, but it's about research. And so what I want to propose is that universities and colleges can be honest brokers in terms of this kind of uh, discussion, providing these kinds of spaces to critically discuss all sides of an issue, uh, instead of shouting at each other in a vacuum, in a, in a, a sound vacuum, the way it does happen. There's also, to look at this globally, and I would say, from the United States point of view, that our democracy is under attack, with the rise of conservative, often misogynistic, homophobic, racist, and anti-Semitic populism, and fascism, that's in the US, in Australia, in Europe. And who will hold the line? If not us, then who? We teach our budding feminist students, <coughs> in fact, all our students in our classes, that's critical to push back against structural inequalities and things like fake news that have become ubiquitous and gaslighting, that is, being able to pick what's true from the chafe because there's so much out there, right? How do you, how, how do you discern? So the critical thinking that goes on and <clears throat> using social media the way that our students do to share our critical information and research you need to get it into the hands also of policymakers who can use it. They're looking for solutions too because the traditional ways are not working. So our research could actually be helpful in that sense. We also must enhance our own regional, national, and global networks. Think of intersectionality of issues and the power of those linkages within the organizations that you belong to. This conference is a perfect example of that strategy. And again, you know, thanks for having me. <coughs> so, in conclusion, and this is me, my position, you don't have to believe it. 
I don't think we can give fear or silence a place in our institutions. If not us, then who? That's my whole mantra. We must not <clears throat> fear losing the support of our privileges to call out false claims. And we have to do this through our data and research. Um, and if we don't do this, if we give in to this uh, as academics, then we're sort of abrogating a responsibility for the greater purpose of higher education as a space for truth, our truths. It's a, really one of the few places where I believe we can do this work. And we must not give fear or silence a place in any of our institutions. Thank you.